Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the Virtual Vertica BDC 2020. Today's breakout session is entitled Autonomous Monitoring Using Machine Learning. My name is Sue LeClaire, Director of Marketing at Vertica, and I'll be your host for this session. Joining me is Larry Lancaster, Founder and CTO at Zebrium. Before we begin, I encourage you to submit questions or comments during the virtual session. You don't have to wait. Just type your question or comment in the question box below the slides and click Submit. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we'll answer as many questions as we're able to during that time. Any questions that we don't address, we'll do our best to answer them offline. Alternatively, you can also go and visit Vertica, Vertica Forums to post your questions after the session. Our engineering team is planning to join the forums to keep the conversation going. Also, just a reminder that you can maximize your screen by clicking the double arrow button in the lower right corner of the slides. And yes, this virtual session is being recorded and will be available for you to view on demand later this week. We'll send you a notification as soon as it's ready. So let's get started. Larry, over to you. Hey, great. Thanks so much. So, uh, so hi, my name is Larry Lancaster, uh, and I'm here to talk to you today about something that I think whose time has come, and that's autonomous monitoring. So with that, let's get into it. So machine data is my life. Um, I know that's a sad life, but it's true. So, so I've spent most of my career kind of taking telemetry data from products, uh, either in the field, but, uh, we used to call it in the field, or nowadays uh, that's been deployed, <clears throat> uh, and uh, bringing that data back like log files, and stats, and then building stuff on top of it. So tools to run the business or services to sell back to users and customers. And so, you know, after doing that a few times, it kind of got to the point where you know, I was really sort of sick of building the same kind of thing from scratch every time. So I figured, why not? Why not go start a company and 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 do it so that it, so that we don't have to do it manually ever again. So uh, it's interesting to note. I put a little I put a little uh, sentence here saying companies where I got to use Vertica. So it's, I've been actually kind of working with Vertica for a long time now, pretty much since they came out of Alpha, and I've really, uh, I've really been enjoying their technology ever since. So our vision is basically that I want a system that will characterize incidents before I notice. So an incident uh, is, you know, we used to call it a support case uh, or a ticket in IT or a support case in support. Nowadays, you may have a DevOps team or a set of SREs who are monitoring a production uh, sort of deployment, and so they'll call it an incident. So I'm looking for I'm looking for something that will notice and characterize an incident before I notice and have to go have to go digging into log files and stats to figure out what what happened, right? And so <clears throat> that's a pretty heady goal. Um, and so, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about how we do that. So, so if we look at logs in particular, logs, uh, logs today. If you look at log monitoring, so monitoring is kind of, it's kind of that whole umbrella term that we use to talk about how we monitor systems in the field that we've shipped, or how we monitor production deployments in a in a more modern stack. Uh, and and so basically there are log monitoring tools, um, but they have a number of, of drawbacks. And you know, for one thing, they're they're kind of slow in the sense that if something breaks and I need to go to to, to a log file, actually, it's chances are really good, right? That if there if if you have a new issue, if it's an unknown unknown problem, you're going to end up in a log file. And so the problem then becomes basically you're you're searching around looking for what's the root cause of the incident, right? Uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of time consuming. So uh, they're, they're also fragile, and this is largely because log, log data is completely unstructured, right? So 
So there's no formal formal grammar for a log file, right? And so so you have this situation where if I write a parser today, and that parser is going to you know do something, it's going to execute some automation, it's going to open or update a ticket, it's going to maybe restart a service or whatever it is that I want to happen. Um, what will happen is later, uh, you know, upstream, someone who's someone who's writing the code that produces that log message, they might do something really, really useful for me they, or for users, and they might go fix a spelling mistake in that log message. And then the next thing you know, all the automation breaks, right? So it's so it's a very fragile, it's a very fragile source for for automation, and and finally. So because of that, people will set, set alerts on, oh, well, tell me how many thousands of errors are happening every hour, or some horrible metric like that. And then that becomes the only visibility you have into the data. So so because of all of this, it's a very human-driven, slow, fragile process. And so, so, you know, basically we've set out to kind of, kind of up-level that a bit. Yeah, so I touched on this already, right? So the truth is, if if you do have a if you do have a an, an incident, you're going to end up in log files to the root cause. It's almost always the case, and so you have to wonder if that's the case. Why do most people use metrics only for monitoring? And the reason is related to the problems I just described. They're already structured, right? So so for logs, you've got this mess of stuff, and so you only want to dig in there when you absolutely have to. But ironically, it's where a lot of the information that you need actually is, right? So we have a model today, and this model used to work pretty well. Um, and that model is called index and search, and it basically means you treat log files like they're text documents. And so you index them, and when there's some issue you have to drill into, then you go searching, right? So let's look at that model, right? So 20 years ago, uh, we, we had sort of a shrimp, shrink wrap software delivery model. You had an incident, and with that incident, maybe you had you had one customer, and you had you know a monolithic application and, and a handful of log files. And so it's perfectly natural. In fact, usually you could just vi the the log file and 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 search that way. Or if there's a lot of them, you could you could index them and search them that way. And that all worked very fun, that very well. It scaled because the developer or the support engineer had to be an expert in those few things and those few log files and understand what they meant. But today, everything has changed completely, right? So we live in a, in a software as a service world. What that means is, you know, for a given incident, first of all, you're going to be affecting thousands of users. You're going to have potentially 100 services that are deployed in your environment. You're going to have a thousand log streams to sift through, and yet you're still kind of stuck in the situation where to go find out what's the matter, you're going to have to search through the log files. So this is kind of the unacceptable uh, sort of out, uh, position we're in today. So for us, the, the future will not be indexed in search, and that's simply because it cannot scale. And the reason I say that it, it can't scale is because it all it, it all kind of is bottlenecked by 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 a person in their eyeball. So so you continue to drive up the amount of data that has to be sifted through, the complexity of the stack that has to be understood, and you still at the end of the day for MTTR purposes you still have the same bottleneck which is the eyeball, uh, and so. This model, I believe, is fundamentally broken, and that's why I believe in five years you're going to be in a situation where most monitoring of unknown unknown problems is going to be uh, done autonomously, and those issues will be characterized autonomously uh, because there's no other way it can happen. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about autonomous monitoring itself. So autonomous monitoring uh, basically means if you can imagine an, a monitoring platform, right, then 
and you watch the monitoring platform. Maybe you watch the the alerts coming from it, or you watch you watch the more importantly, you kind of watch the dashboards and try to see if something looks weird, right? Um, so an uh, autonomous monitoring is is the notion that the platform should do the watching for you, and and only let you know when something is going wrong, and should should kind of give you a window into what happened. So if you look at this example I have on screen, just to take it just to take it really slow and absorb the concept of autonomous monitoring, the idea is that <clears throat> so here in this in this example we've stopped the database and as a result down below you can see there were a bunch of fallout. This is an Atlassian stack, so you can imagine you've got a Postgres database and then you've got uh, you've got uh, sort of Bitbucket and Confluence and Jira and these various other components that you know need the database operating in order to function. Uh, and so, <clears throat> so what what this is doing is it's calling out, hey, the the root cause is the database stopped, and here's the symptoms. Now, now you might be wondering, so what? I mean, I could go write a script to do this sort of thing. So here's what's interesting about this very particular example, and I'll show a couple more examples that are a little more involved. But but here's the interesting thing. So so in the software that that came up with this incident and and opened this incident and put this root cause and symptoms in there, there's no code that does anything about uh, timestamp formats, severities, Atlassian, Postgres, databases. Bitbucket, Confluence. There's no there's no uh, regexes that talk about starting, stopped, RDBMS, uh, swallowed an exception, and so on and so forth. So what you might wonder how it's possible then that that something which is completely ignorant of the stack could come up with could come up with this description, which is exactly what a human would have had to do to figure out what happened. And, and, and I'm going to get into how we do that. But that's what autonomous monitoring is about. It's about getting into a set of telemetry from a stack with no prior information and understanding when something breaks. And I, I, could, I could give you the punchline right now, which is there are fundamental ways that so software behaves when it's breaking. And by looking at hundreds of data sets that people have generously allowed us to, to use, containing incidents, we've been able to characterize that and now generalize it to apply it to, uh, to any new data set and stack. So here's an interesting one right here, right? So, so there's a fellow, uh, David Gildy, just a genius with, with, uh, in the monitoring space. He's been, he's been working with us for the last couple of months. So he said, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to run some chaos experiments. So for, so for those of you who don't know what chaos engineering is, here's the idea. So basically, let's say I'm running a Kubernetes cluster, and uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll use a, sort of a chaos injection test, uh, something like Litmus, and basically it will inject issues, it'll, it'll break things in my, in my application randomly uh, to see if my monitoring picks it up. And so this is what chaos engineering is built around. It's built around... Uh, sort of generating lots of uh, random problems and seeing how the stack responds. So in this particular case, uh, uh, David went in and he, uh, you know, he, he went in and he deleted, uh, basically one of the tests that was presented through Litmus did a delete of a pod delete. And so uh, that's going to basically take out some containers that are, that are, part of the service layer and so then you'll see all kinds of things break and so what you're seeing here which is interesting this is why I like to use this example because it's it's um, it's uh, it's it's actually kind of eye-opening so the, the chaos tool itself generates logs and of course uh, through kubernetes like as all the all the log file locations and the, uh, that are on the host and the container logs are known and those are all pulled back to us automatically so one of the log files we have is actually the chaos tool that's doing the that's doing the breaking, right? And so what the tool said here when it de went to determine what the root cause was, was it noticed that the, that there was a, there was this process that had these 
messages happen, initializing deletion lists, selecting a pod to kill, blah, blah, blah. It's saying that the root cause is the chaos test. And it's absolutely right. That is the root cause. But usually chaos tests don't get picked up themselves. You're supposed to be just kind of picking up the symptoms. But this is what happens when you when you're able to kind of tease out root cause from symptoms autonomously is you end up getting a much more meaningful answer, right? So here's another example. So if, so essentially we, you know, we collect the log files, but we also have um, a Prometheus scraper. So if you export Prometheus metrics, um, we'll scrape those and we'll send, we'll, we'll collect those as well. And so we'll use those for our autonomous monitoring as well. So what you're seeing here is um, an issue where uh, I believe this is the uh, where we ran the something out of disk space. But so when it it opened an incident, uh, but what's also interesting here is you see that it pulled that metric to sh to say that this metric uh, was actually a that that the spike in this metric was a was a was a symptom of this running out of space. Um, and so again, there's nothing that knows anything about file system usage, memory, CPU, any of that stuff. There, there's no actual hard-coded logic anywhere to explain any of this. And so the concept of autonomous monitoring is looking the way at a stack the way a human being would. If you can imagine how you would walk in and monitor something, how you would think about it, you'd go looking around for rare things, things that are not normal, then you would look for indicators of of breakage and you would see do, do those seem to be correlated in some dimension that is how the system works right so as i mentioned a moment ago metrics really do kind of complete the picture for us right so we end up in a situation where we have a one-stop shop for incident root cause right so how does that work well we ingest and we structure the log files right so if we're getting we're getting the logs, we'll ingest them and we'll structure them. I'm going to show a little bit what that structure looks like uh, and how that goes into the database in a moment. Uh, and then, of course, we ingest and structure the Prometheus metrics. But here, structure really is should have an asterisk next to it because the metrics are mostly structured already. They have names. Um, if you go to the, if you have your own scraper. Um, as opposed to going into the time series Prometheus database and pulling metrics from there, you can keep a lot more information about about metadata about those metrics um, from the exporter's perspective. So we keep all of that too. Then we do our anomaly detection on both of those sets of data, um, and and then we cross correlate metrics and log anomalies, uh, and then we create incidents. So this is at a high level, kind of what's happening. Um, without any uh, sort of um, stack-specific logic built in. So we had some exciting recent validation. So my data is uh, a, a pretty uh, big player in the Kubernetes space. Um, so essentially, they do they do Kubernetes as a managed service. They have uh, tens of thousands of customers that they manage their Kubernetes clusters for them, um, and then they are also involved both in the Open EBS project as well as in the Litmus project I mentioned a moment ago. That's their tool so for chaos engineering. So they're a pretty big player in the Kubernetes space. Um, so essentially they said, oh, okay, let's see if this is real. So, so what they did was they, <clears throat> they set up our, our collectors, which took three minutes in Kubernetes, and then they went and they, they uh, using Litmus, they reproduced uh, eight incidents that that their actual real world customers had hit and they were trying to remember the ones that were the hardest to uh, figure out the root cause at the time. And we picked up and, and put a root cause indicator in, in, that was correct in 100% of these incidents um, with no training configuration or metadata required. So that's kind of, this is kind of what autonomous monitoring is, is all about. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about how it works. Um, so like I said, there's no information included or required about, so for, so like if you imagine a log file, for example, right? Now, commonly over to the left-hand side of every line, there'll be some sort of a prefix. And, and what I mean by that is you'll see like a timestamp 
or a, and a severity and maybe there's a PID and maybe there's a function name and maybe there's some other stuff there. So, so basically that's kind of, it's common data elements for a large portion of the uh, lines in a given log file, but, uh, uh, and, but, you know, of course the contents change. And so, so we, so basically today, like if you look at a typical log manager, um, they'll talk about connectors and what connectors means is for an application, it'll generate, it'll generate a certain prefix format in a log. And that means what's the format of the timestamp and what else is in the prefix. And this lets the tool pick it up. And so if you have an app that doesn't have a connector, you're out of luck. Well, what we do is we learn those prefixes dynamically with machine learning. You do not have to have a connector, right? And what that means is that <clears throat> if you come in with your own application, it, the system will just work for it from day one. You don't have to have connectors. You don't have to describe the prefix formats. It's just, that's just, that's so yesterday, right? So really what we want to be doing is up-leveling what the, what the system is doing to the point where it's kind of like working like a human would, right? You look at a log line, you know what, what's a timestamp, you know what's a pin, you know what's a function name, you know where the prefix ends and where the variable parts begin. You know what's a parameter over there in, in the variable parts. Um, and sometimes you may need to see a couple examples to know what was a variable, but you'll figure it out as quickly as possible. And that's exactly how the system goes about it. Um, as a result, we kind of embrace free tax logs, right? So, so if you look at a typical stack, most of the logs generated in a typical stack are, are used, they're usually free text. Um, even structured logging typically will have a message, sort of a message attribute, which then inside of it has the, the free text <laughs> message, right? So, so it's kind of like, uh, for, for us, that's, that's not a bad thing. That's, that's, that's okay. In fact, I'd prefer that people just use, you know, the purpose of a log is to inform people. Um, and so there's no need to go rewrite the whole logging stack, right? Just because you want a machine to handle it. Why can't machines go figure it out for themselves, right? So, so, so you, you give us the logs and we'll figure out the grammar, not only for the prefix, but also for the variable uh, message part. So I already went into this, but there's more that's usually required uh, for configuring a log manager with alerts. You have to give it keywords. You have to give it application behaviors. You have to tell it um, some, you know, some prior knowledge. And of course, the problem with all of that is um, that, that the, the most important uh, events that you'll ever see in a log file are the rarest, right? Those are the ones that are, are one out of a billion. And so, you may not know what's going to be the right keyword in advance to pick up the next breakage, right? So, so we don't want that information from you. Um, we'll figure that out for ourselves. So as, as the data comes in, essentially we, we parse it and we categorize it, uh, as I've mentioned. Um, and and by, when I say categorize, what I mean is if you look at a certain given log file, you'll notice that some of the lines are kind of the same thing. Right, so this one will say X happened five times, and then maybe a few lines below it'll say X happened six times. But that's basically the same event type. It's just a different instance of that event type, and it has a different uh, val value for for the one of the parameters. Right. So, so when I say categorization, what I mean is figuring out those unique types, and and I'll show an example of that next. Um, anomaly detection we do on top of that. So anomaly detection on metrics um, in a in a very sort of time series by time series manner with lots of tunables is is a well understood um, problem. Um, so we also do this on the event types so occurrences. So you can think of each event type occurring in time as sort of a point process, and then you can develop statistics and distributions on that, and you can do anomaly detection on those. Um, so once we have all of that, we've kind of extracted features essentially from metrics and from, from logs. We do pattern recognition uh, on the correlations across different channels of information. So different event types, different log types, different hosts, different containers, um, and then of course across to the metrics. 
Um, and based on all this uh, cross-correlation, we end up with a root cause identification. So that's essentially at, at a high level how it works. What's interesting from, from, from the perspective of, uh, of this call particularly is that uh, incident detection needs relationally structured data. It really does. You need to have all the instances of a certain event type that you've ever seen easily accessible. You need to have the values for, for a given sort of parameter easily, quickly available so you can figure out what's the distribution of this over time. How often does this event type happen? You can run analytical queries against that uh, information so that you can quickly in real time do anomaly detection against new data. Okay. So here's an example of what this looks like, and this is this is kind of part of part of the work that we that we've done. So at the top you see some examples of log lines, right? So that's kind of a snippet of three lines out of a log file, and you see one in the middle there that's kind of highlighted with colors, right? And this is this is a, I mean it's a little messy, but it's not atypical of the log file that you'll see pretty much anywhere. So there you've got a timestamp and a severity and a function name, and then you've got some other information. And then finally you have the variable part, and, and that's gonna have that's gonna have sort of this, there's kind of, you can tell that checkpoint for memory scrubber is probably something that's written in English just so that the person who's reading the log file can, can understand, and then there's some parameters that are put in, right? So now if you look at how we structure that, the way it looks is there's gonna be there's going to be three tables uh, assigned to that correspond to the three event types that we see above. And so we're going to look at the one that corresponds to, to the one in the middle. So if we look at that table, there you'll see a table with columns, one for severity, for function name, for time zone, uh, and so on, and date and PID. And then you see over to the right with the colored columns, there's the... Um, there's the parameters that were pulled out from from the variable part of that message, and uh, and so they're put in, they're typed, and they're in integer columns. So this is the way structuring needs to work with logs to be able to do efficient and effective anomaly detection. And as far as I know, we're the first people to do this um, uh, in line. So <clears throat> clicking the forward button here. All right. So let's talk now about Vertica and why we take those tables and put them in Vertica. So Vertica really is an MPP column store, but it's more than that because nowadays when you say column store, people sort of, you know, think, oh yeah, so so like uh, for example, Cassandra is a column store or whatever, but it's not, right? Cassandra is not a column store in the sense that Vertica is. Um, so. So, right. So, 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 Vertica was kind of built from the bottom, from the ground up, to be, uh, to be, you know. So it's the original column store, right? So back at the back in the C store project at Berkeley, right? That 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 Stonebreaker was involved in. Um, he said, you know, let's explore what kind of efficiencies we could get out of a out of a real columnar database. And and what he found was that he and his grad students who started Vertica. But what they found was that what they can do is they can, they can build a database that gets orders of magnitude better query performance for the kinds of analytics I'm talking about here today um, with orders of magnitude less uh, data storage uh, underneath. So, so, so when we look at that, right, so, so building on top of machine data, as I mentioned, is hard because it doesn't have any defined schemas. Um, but we can use an RDBMS like Vertica once we've structured the data to, to do the analytics that we need to do. So I talked a little bit about this, but if you think about machine data in general, it's perfectly suited for a column restore because if you imagine uh, laying out sort of all the attributes of sort of an event type, right? So you can imagine that each each occurrence is going to have you know, so there may be I mean, there may be say three or four function names that that are going to occur for ever for all the instances of a given event type, and so and so if you were to sort all of those 
sort of event type, event instances by function name, what you would what you would find is that you'd have sort of long million long runs of of the same function name over and over. So what you have in general in in machine data is lots and lots of slowly varying attributes, um, lots of low low cardinality data that gets almost completely compressed out when you when you use a real column store. So you end up with a massive footprint reduction on disk. And it also, that propagates sort of through the analytical pipeline because Vertica does late materialization, which means it tries to carry that data through memory uh, with that same efficiency, right? Um, so the scale-out architecture, of course, uh, is really suitable for P-to-scale workloads. Um, also, I should I should point out I'm gonna I was gonna mention it in in another slide or two but we use the Vertica Eon architecture and we have had no problems scaling that uh, in the cloud it's it's a beautiful sort of rewrite of the entire data layer of Vertica it is like the performance and and flexibility of Eon is just unbelievable and so I've really been enjoying using it. Um, I, I was skeptical you could get a real column store to run in the cloud effectively, but I was completely wrong. Um, so finally, I mean, I should mention that, you know, like if you look at column stores, really, to me, Vertica is the one that has sort of, it has the full SQL support, it has the ODBC drivers, it has the ACID, it has the ACID compliance, which means I don't need to worry about these things as an application developer, right? So I'm, I'm laying out the reasons that I like to use Vertica. Right, so I touched on this already, but um, really using, essentially what's what's amazing is, and is that Vertica Eon is basically using S3 as an object store. And of course there are, I mean, there are, so there are other offerings like, like the one that Vertica does with peer storage that doesn't use S3, but but what I find amazing is how well the system performs using S3 as an object store and how they manage to keep an actual consistent database, and they do. I mean, we've had, you know, issues where we've we've gone and shut down hosts or hosts have been shut down and on us and we have to restart the database and we don't have any consistency issues. It's unbelievable, the, the work that they've done. Um, so essentially another thing that's great about the way it works is you can – you can be you can use the S3 as sort of a since it's shared object store you can have query nodes kind of querying from that um, set of files uh, largely independently of the nodes that are writing to them so you you avoid this sort of bottleneck issue where you've got contention over you know over who's writing what and who's reading what and so on so I, I've I've been I've found the performance using separate subclusters for for our UI and for the ingest um, has been amazing. Um, another couple of things that they have is sort of they have a lot of in-database machine learning uh, libraries. There's actually some cool stuff on, on their GitHub um, that we've used. Um, one thing that, I've, that we make a lot of use of is sort of the sequence and time series analytics, which basically means sequence analytics is, so for example, in our product, you can, so even though we do all this stuff autonomously, you can also go create alerts for yourself. And one of the kinds of alerts you can do is say, you can say, okay, if this kind of event happens um, uh, within, you know, so much time, and then this kind of an event happens, but not this one, then, uh, then you can be alerted, right? So you can have these kind of sequences that you define of events that would indicate a, a, a problem. And we use their sequence analytics for that. So it's it's um, it kind of gives you really good performance on some of these uh, sort of queries where you're wanting to p pull out sequences of events uh, from a fact table, right? And time series analytics um, is really useful if you want to do analytics on the metrics and you want to do gap filling interpolation on that. Um, it's actually really fast and performant, and it's easy to use through SQL. So those are those are a couple of of Vertica extensions that, that we use. So finally, I would just like to encourage everybody, hey, come try us out. It should be up and running in a few minutes if you're using Kubernetes. Um, if not, it's you know, however long it takes you to run an installer. Um, and uh, so you can just come to our website, um, pick it up and try out autonomous monitoring. And uh, I want to thank everybody for your time. 
and uh, we can open it up for Q&A.